Thompson, author of this very handsome new book, which I shall remind you later you can buy for the discounted price of 15 pounds. We have some coffee yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, Adam and I appeared on a panel given by our friends at Slightly Fox a few years ago to talk about this book, <laughs> which you would have thought looking at it was a definitive <laughs> account of a writer's life. But no. Uh, Adam did hint at the time that were the various things about which he had to be discreet, and he hinted that they involved Macari's affairs uh, with a string of women. What he was very discreet about was his relationship with the author, um, who had encouraged him at first to write this book but then put obstacles in his path and eventually tried to undermine him. Mm. So those two stories, both of fascinating to members of the Biographies Club, uh, have at last been told in this book. We'll come to that uh, later, but perhaps we should begin, for those of you who don't know the story, with the quite torturous history of the John Carey biography, beginning years and years ago when Robert Harris thought that he might write one. And um, perhaps you, Bradden, could take up the story from there. Yes, it, well, it goes even further back than that. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 I think the first proposed biographer self-proposed biographer of uh, John Le Carre was Graham Lord. Some of you will remember Graham Lord, a uh, literary editor of the Express. 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 Yeah. Anyway, he circulated a proposal for uh, a biography of John Le Carre, um, which found its way into David's hands and, um, and uh, received a writ. <laughs> um, uh, um, in fact, maybe he received more than one. Um, and uh, although he had by that time uh, got a rather um, enticing book contract, he backed off. Um, mm -hmm. And um, uh, so uh, soon after that, uh, Robert Harris, um, who was commissioned by. Um, that's a, a very incestuous story. <laughs> <laughs> commissioned by. Uh, um, uh, an editor at Hutchinson uh, called Robin Sisman, i.e. my wife. <laughs> um, I was cross with her at the time. I said, oh, I wanted to write that book. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, he was commissioned to write it, and um, he did do some research, um, uh, but he kept on not writing. He had other things to do, as you may know. He has a successful career as a novelist, and he has uh, expensive overheads to keep up. Um, and, and so he um, didn't write it and didn't write it. And um, every now and then I would say to Robert, are you going to write that book? Because if you don't, I'd like to have a go. And we had a pub lunch together in, I think, uh, 2010. Um, uh, and he said, I'm really not going to write it. So don't let me stand in your way. Um, and at that point, I wrote a letter to David Cornwall. John McCarry's real name was David Cornwall, um, which is re reproduced, uh, in fact, similarly in this book. Um, uh, no, my letter isn't reproduced. His reply is reproduced. I'm sorry, I misled you. Um, but he wrote an encouraging reply, and I went to see him at his house in Hampstead. And we, we sort of agreed then and there that I would write a book that um, would be at arm's length was the expression used. Um, so it, he didn't want me to use the term authorised, though it's what a lot of people would call authorised. I had full access to him, to his, all his papers, and to he gave me a list of friends and enemies to, uh, <laughs> to, to talk to. Um, uh, so um, uh, we, we, and we, we uh, um, had a contract between us. In fact, um, uh, one slight problem was that um, we couldn't get our agents to agree, but that was eventually <laughs> um, uh, sorted out. 
Um, uh, and um, initially all seemed to be going well. He did from time to time, he did say to me at one point, and in fact we had quite a lot of laughs and quite a jolly time, he said, uh, I know it's supposed to be warts and all, but it seems to be all warts and no all. <laughs> um, and he, he, Has he read anything? Uh, no, he hadn't at that stage, no. But, um, you were asking questions. I was asking, yes, yes. Right. And he said, why don't you believe what I tell you? Mm. And I said, well, that's, David, you see, the trouble is you were on record as saying that you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and in general, anyway, I'm very sceptical of oral evidence. I, I, as I'm sure, like other biographers in this room, tend to prefer written records. Um, um, I find interviews are useful for context and sometimes for directing me towards written records I might not otherwise have found, contemporary written records. Um, but, um, uh, and so, I mean, David at a later stage said, you've had unprecedented access to me, which is true, we spent a lot of time together, um, and yet uh, you haven't taped what I've been saying. And I said, that's because you stipulated at the beginning that I wasn't allowed to take it. <laughs> but anyway, I said, you know, what do you, you know, I make notes as we've been talking, as you no doubt observed. Um, and sometimes I would make notes, as no doubt again, and others of you in this room probably do, which were not necessarily taking down what he was saying, but what I thought about what he was saying. <laughs> uh, Anyway, um, we proceeded this way, and I, 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 I realised at an early stage, in fact, I went to interview, I'm sure many of you will be, know, be familiar with the name Bob Gottlieb, who was uh, 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 the, the long-term chief editor at Knopf, um, described in his obituary, he died in the summer, um, as perhaps the most influential editor of the, the second half of the 20th century, uh, who was David's editor, and Bob described how he had um, realized when he met David that David was going to be very tricky indeed. <laughs> uh, this man is very smart, he said to me, and I realized that he's going to outsmart me and the only way I can do it is to play everything completely straight. And that's what I tried to do, um, uh, is to play everything completely straight. So when, for example, I encountered uh, um, a mistress uh, who later published her own memoir, um, under the name Sue Lyker Dawson, I told David straight away. Uh, his response was, oh, God. <laughs> um, um, and um, this, was early on. this was about halfway through, I suppose. Um, but he did become increasingly agitated, particularly about the personal life. Um, and, I, I mean, I, I, I said, you know, enough people are aware that you've had a messy personal life and indeed you know your involvement with the Kennaways which some of you will know about um, uh, um, is, has been the subject of no fewer than three books one by each of the three of you concerned um, uh, so um, uh, no one read no one read well some people read it um, uh, um, uh, and um, so uh, it was, uh, I said, this is a, a subject we have to deal with, uh, albeit we <coughs> perhaps deal with it in general terms rather than specifics. But he became increasingly agitated. Um, and um, uh, this led to a, 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 a sort of tension between us, which became more and more exacerbated as I got nearer and nearer to finishing the book. And at one stage, he recruited his oldest son, Simon Cornwall, uh, to act as a kind of mediator. And Simon came down to visit me at my home in Bristol and uh, um, proposed that I keep a secret annex of material not for publication in this, this book, but for publication <coughs> after David's death. Um, perhaps I should have waited <coughs> until after David's death to, to publish the book, but there were financial reasons apart from the else not to do so. Um, uh, and, um, and of course no one knows when somebody's going to die um, so uh, um, I, the secret, that secret annex is the core of the new book um, uh, um, it, is, uh, it, it, it consists of material that David didn't want me to publish and an account also of our dealings together um, uh, and the um, increasingly fraught nature of those including a most extraordinary scene, which um, uh, I do 
uh, described in this new book, when David decided that it was a good idea for me to interview his wife, Jane, about his infidelities. <laughs> uh, so I went round to their house in Hampstead, and David ushered me into a room with Jane, and then said, there you go, and then <laughs> went off for a walk on the heath. And I don't know which of us was the more um, embarrassed and found it more di um, but I know she was extremely uncomfortable about this, and so was I. I mean, poor woman. And I felt that we were both, in a way, puppets being manipulated by the man walking on the heath. Um, maybe characters in one of his novels, I don't know. Um, but um, uh, poor Jane was aware of some of what um, uh, he got up to, certainly by no means all. Um, so, I mean, um, one of the... Th so he did talk about, his, you know, uh, why he was... Um, um, persistently unfaithful to Jane, um, and he, he, he uh, there's a passage in fact that she wrote to me, which I, I might just um, uh, read to you. Um, he talked about his infidelities as a kind of drug. He says, um, uh, "My infidelities produced in my life a duality and a tension that became almost a necessary drug for my writing, a dangerous edge of some kind." They are not, therefore, a dark part of my life separate from the high literary calling, so to speak, <coughs> but, alas, integral <coughs> and inseparable. So, do you believe that, or is that your self justification <laughs> <laughs> Can I come back to that question? Yes. <laughs> but it seemed to me that there was at least a, um, a prima facie case for examining that issue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, I, th I mean, I, in fact, I, well, perhaps I should answer that. I mean, right at the end, in my final chapter, I, I say, you know, I'm, I'm still, in a way, in two minds about him. Was he um, a restless romantic, uh, or was he a heartless father? <coughs> and I, I sort of think he was a bit of both. I mean, there is a schizophrenia about him. Um, I do also address the question of whether it matters that he lied to his wife and lied consistently. Um, and it matters to us as readers of his book. Yes. I think it is important for a novelist. Novelists have to confront the truth, like biographers. Um, uh, and um, uh, I came to the conclusion that in his fiction he does confront the truth, but in his life he didn't. So I sort of, I say, perhaps it's a tricky formula, but I say my conclusion is that David Cornwall was a liar, but, but John le Carre was a truth teller. Mm -hmm. Looking back to the early years of your last months, were there intimations of what was to come? Sorry, sorry. Looking back to the early years of writing the book, back to 2011, 2012. Did you have, now, looking back, did you think I was, that there were signs then that there was trouble to come? Well, I, I, he, yes and no. I mean, I, did, I was aware that um, uh, he was a tricky person to deal with, and I also felt that he was usually at least one step ahead of me. He would do things like say to me, well, if I were you writing my biography, the kind of question I'd be asking me now would be. <laughs> and and, and, and play all sorts of other tricks. Um, uh, one of his tricks was to let drop that he knew something about my personal life. Um, uh, 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 some, some bit of information that, you know, how does he know that? Um, uh, as if he'd been spying on me. I think that was one of his techniques. Um, he, there, there was an element with him of, of having to be in control, um, and I think this was, this was in, in his relationship with me as with everyone else. Um, another element with him, incidentally, which is uh, uh, um, one of the things I find quite troubling, is that um, whenever a friend of his, uh, a male friend of his, uh, um, ventured to criticise any of his work, David's response would be to try and seduce that uh, friend's wife. Um, he did that on several occasions. Um, 
Um, for example, with Nicholas Mosley, who's quite a close friend. Um, uh-huh. um, uh, and it's, it feels like a kind of attempt to sort of unman the, um, the individual involved. He didn't like criticism. Um, uh, so I suppose there were intimations of trouble. And, 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 and Robert Harris had said to me, you'll never be able to publish this book in David's lifetime. And I suppose, in a way, that was true. I, but I, I published a book, but the, the, there was more to be said, and that's why there's this new book. Why do you think he didn't realise what a, a proper biography of him wouldn't, would entail? Uh, that's very curious, because it mean, seemed to me that he had thought quite a lot about biography. Mm. But then he, he said to me at one point, uh, I've, you know, you're, you're not taking down what I say. Um, and he seemed to regard me as like a stenographer who would be just sort of, as it were, writing a, a sort of a, uh, as told to um, account. Um, I said, well, it's not like that. It's, a, it's my version of your life, not, 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 not your version. Um, um, but he, 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 I, I think there was a, a, a bit of a schizophrenia there. He sort of thought that, um, perhaps he just thought he could talk me round. I mean, I, some of you will perhaps be aware that there's a film out called The Pigeon Tunnel, mm-hmm. where um, he, um, which consists largely of interviews between him and a filmmaker called Errol Morris. And Errol Morris has become very touchy about the suggestion, which I think is manifest that um, David ran rings around him, um, um, but he did run rings around him. I mean, I will, he just, um, he just. Uh, I, in fact, when I watched the film, it's quite an entertaining film. I recommend it, but it is, um, it's David coming out with the same old stuff that you know, much of which I knew either wasn't true or was embellished or left stuff out. Um, and Errol's become very touchy about this, and there's a very enjoyable interview he did with the New York Times, which I strongly recommend. <laughs> Bruce, you, you sent it to me. Um, um, uh, some of you will know Bruce Hunter, who was David's agent for a bit. Um, um, 25 years. 25 years. Wow. And did a very good job for him, I hasten to say. I was amazed at, 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 at the deals you negotiated for him. Anyway, um, uh, so uh, we, what was the... Well, the next question I wanted to ask you was about Simon, and it does seem extraordinary that Le Carre's son should have said, well, you're going to find out about all these affairs, uh, you should, here's my idea for how you could do it. Has that been the attitude of, I think he had three children, doesn't he? The three sons of the first marriage. Yeah. yeah. And there's one son of the second marriage. Right. Nick is the son of, of Jane, and the three Simon, and his, the two brothers, uh, were sons of Anne. One of those brothers, Tim, produced, edited a volume of letters, um, and and uh, very sadly died before it was published. He, he, was, he, he died while it was in proof. Um, in fact, it was in a way, Tim who uh, let the cat out of the bag and. Uh, because um, there was, first of all, there was the, the Kiss and Tell memoir, and she tells us a lot by this woman, Sue Lyker Dawson. And then Tim produced this volume of letters, including several letters to mistresses. Um, so um, it wasn't as if the brothers were trying to cover this up. Um, I, I, I formed quite a good friendship with uh, Simon in particular, who's the eldest brother and the literary executive, but also with the other brothers. Um, and um, uh, um, they are realistic about their father. Um, not being easy, I think, to be John Le Carre's son or sons. Um, and uh, the, the one who I think found it most troubling is the son of the second marriage, Nick, who said to me, I realized that I've been, all my life, I've been sold a lie. I mean, Nick, for example, after his mother and father died, wrote a, 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 a very sort of saccharine piece of, in The Guardian about his parents' ideal marriage, which I think he now much regrets. Um, not that, I mean, that I'm not just saying that there wasn't good things about their marriage. All I'm saying is that there was a lot of bad things too, and I think David treated Jane pretty shabbily. 
some, I mean, some families would have tried to suppress <coughs> what, uh, what you have written about, but not this one. No, their, their line is that everything that is relevant to their father's writing should be known. And they, they are thinking about legacy and about whether or not people are going to be interested in Le Carre as a novelist in 5, 10, 50 years' time. Um, uh, um, I think people will, actually, but I think the jury is out at the moment. As it often happens when somebody dies, that their reputation falls off a cliff, and pretty soon their novels, their book works start going out of print. Um, um, many of you here will be aware of that process, too. Um, and I think the jury is out, really, on Le Carre. And my view, for what it's worth, but I'm not the person to give the judgment, is that he will be regarded as the definitive Cold War novelist, and also, as Blake Morrison said, the laureate of Britain's post-imperial sleepwalk as, as a novelist who perhaps most captured the kind of pain of a certain generation in coming to terms with Britain's much diminished role after the Second World War. Um, I think those are his two major achievements, and he. he I think one could also perhaps say that the Honourable Schoolboy, make a case for it anyway, is one of the one of the novels about Vietnam. Although it's not ostensibly about Vietnam at all, it is about the collapse of Western power in Southeast Asia, and um, it has a kind of sense of a, of a whole system on the edge, um, uh, uh, crumbling. Writers whose strength isn't writing about women tend to be unfashionable at the moment. But I, I started to think on reading your book that if the carrier hadn't had these affairs, his women characters would have been even less convincing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the things we haven't talked about is it, I mean, one, what, it, he would say to women, typically, you are getting me writing again. You know, <laughs> you've woken me up you know, from my sleep. Um, I'm, um, I've been stuck in this dead marriage, he used that expression and many other disparaging expressions, um, um, and now I'm, I'm alive again and, 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 and you are my muse. And to, a, to, to some of them this was a very attractive um, thing. Um, and uh, he would love bomb them, um, uh, um, telling them how wonderful they were and how in love he was, and, and also showering them with presents and, and, and taking them to wonderful um, locations and beautiful hotels and um, with vintage champagne and, 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 and uh, caviar and, and, and no expense spared and, and also draping them with jewellery. Um, uh, and when some of them eventually succumbed and, and said, yes, all right, and I will run off with you, I will be your you know, special person uh, leave your wife, he would rapidly cool off and, <laughs> and, 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 and almost often within months or w even weeks um, um, cut them off altogether. So As I was reading the book, the word grooming came to mind. <laughs> yes, so I mean, I mean, I did, uh, earlier on I was talking about, we were talking about sex, and, and in a way I think these relationships were not about sex, they were about control and seduction. Um, uh, um, he wanted to make women love him. He wanted to make everyone love him. I mean, he wanted to make me love him. Um, uh, and, and then he wanted to be able to discard you. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's cold psychology perhaps, but I think this goes back to his childhood, his very unhappy childhood, where his mother left the family home when he was five years old and didn't come back. And he spent, um, his boyhood was consisted of um, going up to any woman who came to the house and asking her shyly, are you my mother? Um, or um, in saving up, he and his brother saved up their pocket money in the hope that they could one day go and find their mother, like Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. Um, it's, it's pretty heartbreaking, really. And he came to think, he came to believe that women would always abandon you and couldn't be trusted. And the, the way to deal with this in his mind was to abandon them um, before they could abandon him. And what about Ronnie's influence? Ronnie being David Cornwall's father. 
he said it grace. Yes, he had very ambiguous feelings about his father because his father was a very bad man indeed, um, uh, and um, you could say a sociopath um, who served uh, two terms in prison um, and who also abused his children. He pawed his children sexually, um, um, uh, but he was there. He was the only parent that David had, and so he kind of both hated his father and despised his father, but also loved him. Um, I think, I mean, one of the interesting things is, is during the war, when David was a schoolboy, his father was that most despised of individuals, a, uh, a spiv. His father used to, was a black marketeer. Um, and while he, his school friends' fathers might be, and mothers maybe, might, might be, at the front um, might be risking their lives. Some of them had become injured or died. Um, uh, um, David's father was um, exploiting the black market and, 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 and spent a total of, uh, I think, seven days in uniform throughout the, the war. Um, anyway, um, David, possibly David's first piece of fiction was to uh, tell uh, uh, his friends to let, let it be known that really his father was a secret agent this was all a cover, for, and being parachuted into occupied Europe uh, on special missions. Um, so you can see the spy fiction started early. <laughs> and, uh, and in small ways, he was recruited to help Romney in his schemes. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's another thing that David... I mean, David and his brother were recruited in order to go around and tell those elderly people worried about their life savings that they were... You know, they're, they're fine, don't worry, and very soon they would be repaid. Um, mm. um, and David felt terrible about that in retrospect, uh, about being complicit in that, that kind of fraud, um, which happened again and again. Um, How about his time in the Secret Service? With that, was, that has been hard to penetrates, is not it, the truth of it? Yes, I mean, my book isn't just about the women, it's also about the, um, you know, the, uh, the another thing that he, he, he didn't really, we, we, we struggled with was his time as uh, in MI5 and then in MI6. Um, and um, uh, he, um, I mean, I think he liked to, um, he, he would say, oh, I was a very minor spy and not very important while slightly winking at the public and suggesting that actually he was more important than yeah. <laughs> he was really letting it be known. And, and um, a lot of people believed that he was, and he, um, uh, in some way or other, um, behind the scenes, um, and, and, and important. The real truth of it is, um, he, as, as one of his colleagues uh, said to me, he was never involved in a successful operation. He, the only time he ever handled a weapon was during his training. Um, he never went uh, 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 across the Iron Curtain except for a kind of tourist trip to East Berlin. Um, uh, um, so um, uh, his main role was in fact to watch out for the revival of um, extremist parties in West Germany, um, uh, to spy on people in, in, uh, in influential positions in, 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 in the West. Um, and I mean, one of the people who um, I found out about was um, who was the godfather of one of his children was a leading um, social democrat politician who didn't know that David was spying on him, um, <laughs> but he was spying on him. Just as students, he was at Oxford with. He was spying on them. Yes, yeah. yes. And someone, um, there was a chap called Stanley Mitchell who was a, um, a young. Marxist uh, firebrand um, and later became a professor um, at Reading University um, who only discovered um, in his 60s that David had been spying on him as a student and he was terribly hurt because he thought of David as a real friend and in fact David had cultivated their friendship only in order to report on him to MI5. There was another chap, um, uh, um, a Quaker, an um, American Quaker a pacifist called Newt Garver, Newton Garver, who again he was spying on. Um, and David seemed quite untroubled by this. I found it actually quite creepy that he would have. It, 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 what, uh, perhaps if he'd been more overt about it, that would be different. But the fact is, he 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 made these people think that they were close friends of his. He went on a walking holiday with Stanley Mitchell, for example, 
um, only to be pumping him for you know um, information that he could feed back to his MI5 controller. The, 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 the word that came to my mind is the sort of schoolboy word, um, but nevertheless, I think it, it does represent something. Uh, the sneak. <laughs> there was an element of the sneak about him. Yeah. Um, was he a serial adulterer, or did some of his mistresses overlap? As far as I know, none of them overlapped. I think that to is that to his credit? There was never much of a gap between them. No, well, yeah, and there were so many, and I found out about them so easily. I really was not looking for the dirt. But I mean, for example, I went, while I was writing the book, I went to lunch with some friends who lived near Bath, um, and there were some other guests there. Um, said, oh yes, we know someone who had an affair with John the Cat. <laughs> or, um, uh, then, well, late one night at a party in Bristol, I, I found myself chatting to, 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 to someone I'd not met before, and we were actually chatting about Proust. <laughs> um, and uh, he said, oh, uh, uh, a friend of mine's mother had an affair with John the Cat. <laughs> I, in fact, this has continued since the book was finished. I went to a, 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 a birthday, 60th birthday party, um, uh, the other day, and, um, and was talking to one of the other guests there, and she said, oh yes, I know someone whose life was ruined by John McCarran. <laughs> and that, uh, incidentally, I mean, I, I would say that some of the women have recovered and they're fine, and, and it was, but some of the women were so very damaged by David. Um, um, there was um, Liz Tollington, for example, who, um, when she died very early in her 50s, um, um, her mother wrote a angry letter to David, which I, I've read, where she said, it is to my profound regret that he wore your ring until she died. That she wore your ring. Um, he gave her a ring. Um, uh, um, that he, she, this is a woman whose whole life was spent loving David from afar, um, um, mainly, and, and never had a relationship with another man after she met David. And um, David kept this letter. No, David didn't keep the letter. Um, uh, I got the letter. Um, well, that's another story. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us what. Describe events. David didn't keep any letters, by the way. That, oh, that was another curious thing about him, was he was very unsentimental. Um, uh, and I, I was quite cross with him, for example, when I found out that his first editor, publisher, Jack Cahagan, who's really the man who, more than anything else, turned the spy who came in from the cold from being a very successful book into a worldwide phenomenon. He's an American publisher. Um, uh, who, who, who really loved David and had a photograph of David on his desk on the, to the day he died. Um, uh, he, um, his son, no, his, sorry, his... Uh, stepdaughter um, returned her father's letters to uh, her stepfather's letters to David, who destroyed them. Um, and I was I had a bit of a spat with him about this. I said, "You know, that's the sort of thing I need. Um, how can you do that without even telling me?" Um, uh, that was, perhaps that was one of the early signs of trouble. Right. You had dozens of hours of conversations with him. I was very struck that you write him, but that actually a lot of them weren't very useful. No, well I found that he was often telling me things I knew already, or that he told me before, or that I knew weren't true, <laughs> or weren't wholly true, or were only partially true. Um, and he's, you know, he, I mean, this would go back to that Errol Morris film. I mean, I found myself slightly yawning watching that, because, you know, they were the same old embellished stories I'd heard a number of, you know, any number of times, and I knew that some of them were... Well, I mean, I mean in, in here I talk about a story in the Pigeon Tunnel, where um, he, he describes as a teenager being sent by his father to uh, Paris in order to reclaim some... What was, I can't, I'm trying to remember, what, was it money or was it something? Anyway, it was... He, for some reason or other, he found himself going to visit a South American diplomat. Um, who Ronnie had had some business dealings with. And, and David, as David described this story in The Pigeon Tunnel, uh, it was a story of um, uh, innocence and seduction. He, uh, 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 the way he described it, that uh, 
um, this this um, cu this couple, the, the South American diplomat and his his uh, a, a rather attractive wife, this middle aged couple, were trying to get him into bed with them. Um, she was um, rubbing his his uh, ankle with her. Uh, uh, um, her foot uh, under the table and that, that sort of thing um, and this is a this is a, a rather sort of delightful story the way he tells it but I mean it, it, uh, let's say it, it puts another uh, cast on it if, uh, if you know that actually he was with his elder brother at the time um, so um, how true was it? I don't think it's true at all really <laughs> I think it's completely embellished he may have gone to see the um, South American diplomat, but that's that's all the rest is is fabrication. Could you describe your experiences as publication approached, and he became more and more interfering with the text, and then announced that he was going to release a memoir. Yes, well, um, uh, he 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 did interfere with the text, and as I mentioned before, Simon acted as this intermediary and suggested keeping the secret annex. Um, but um, nevertheless, um, he, you know, there was still a lot of interference and a lot of... Uh, I had agreed that he would be the first person to read the manuscript. I sent him the manuscript and uh, something like 48 hours later received a 22-page email um, with something like 200 numbered points. I can test this, this and yeah, I can test that. Um, it amused me, incidentally, when I, I, I met... Um, uh, someone who had known David from a, a long time before, who apparently met David a year or two after my book was published on Hampstead Heath and said, I gather you had a bit of trouble with Adam's book. And David said, oh, Adam's book? Yes, I glanced at it, he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, anyway, um, we had, it, it became, it was very difficult and he kept on, at one stage he, he, he even intimated that he was, he might contemplate suicide. I mean, I felt completely out of my depth. I thought this is, you know, there I am writing a biography of a man who, whose work I much admired, and suddenly he's talking about killing himself. I, 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 I did contemplate abandoning the book at that stage. Um, anyway, um, uh, but, but, but I did make it through to um, proof and then publication. Uh, one of the, his characteristics, by the way, was to go on rewriting his own books. Um, in late into proof stage um, and expecting publishers to agree to that. It was quite difficult for him to accept that my publisher might not be so tolerant. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, and then in the week that my book was due to be published, there was this announcement that he would be publishing his memoir, The Pigeon Tunnel. Uh, and as my then editor, Mike Fishwick, uh, commented, he's trying to seize back control of the agenda. A lot of people felt rather indignant on my behalf and said, you know, how, what a horrible thing to do and what a betrayal. Um, I, I chose not to see it that way. I, I, I feel it's his life, he can do with it as he wanted. I mean, it wasn't helpful, let's put it that way, but, but you know, it, it, um, I, I won't say really any more than that. Um, I think it did... I think it didn't help me with foreign publishers, in particular foreign language publishers, who were... They didn't have the opportunity to compare the two works, and they, you know, if you were given the choice of Sisman on Le Carre or Le Carre on Le Carre, you would probably choose the latter, wouldn't you? <laughs> and as it turned out, the two books were completely different and not really competitors at all. Um, the other thing about the Pigeon Tunnel, incidentally, is that, all, well, more than half of it had been published before. It was reprints of, of some of them pieces that were freely available on the internet, so it was a bit of a, well, you know, it was a cobbled together piece, let's say. Um, uh, he's wrote me a little note on publication, which was, a, which was quite nice, but there was a bit of an edge to it. He said, he said something like, um, enjoy your moment in the sun. Um, <laughs> indicated that it would be brief. <laughs> You, up to that point, you hadn't written a biography of a living person. No. Um, could you now see why you, <laughs> why you hadn't? And what would be your attitude to writing another biography of a living person? Um, cautious. <laughs> I mean, I did, 
imagine that I would ever find someone as tricksy as, as, as David Cornwell again. But, I mean, it is obviously a, 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 a problem. And, a, uh, 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 and, I mean, there are great advantages in writing about a living person because you can go to that person and ask them things. And um, you can also, there are likely to be more other sources available, all the people that that person has known. Whereas, I, I'm, I'm writing a biography now of someone who died only six or seven years ago, but already many of the people who knew him are no longer available. Um, and um, so um, source material disappears from us all the time. So there are great advantages of writing about a living person, but it is, there are these problems. Um, and particularly someone who had as complicated a personal life as, as David Cornwall. Um, and I think um, one needs to have a, a, a strong agreement at the start. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm looking back on it, I feel that he had all the cards except, and I only had one. You know, he was uh, obviously much more famous, um, more, you know, a, 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 a great writer, um, a relatively minor writer. Um, he, he, um, um, he was, uh, had, um, he had control of all the material. It was, after all, his copyright. Um, uh, and of course, he was much richer than I was, and could afford to, to employ, if it came to it, lawyers. To um, um, uh, whereas I would have to back off pretty quickly because I have no uh, um, uh, res reserves. Um, the only card I had was the agreement we'd had at the beginning that the book would be truthful, and I just kept playing this card again and again and again. And he um, complained. And, and, and threatened and, um, uh, and uh, grumbled, but um, he did accept, to some extent, the, 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 the um, worth of that card. Uh, do you think he didn't know what was truthful and what wasn't? I think that's, that is, I mean, that's a problem about him generally. I think, I think one of the things that's interesting about Le Carre is that he comes to believe his own fictions. I, I, I mean, I think novelists do do this anyway, and I think you have to, in a way. You have to believe in the characters that you create in order for them to live. But he had a particularly active imagination, and I think that he, um, he did... Um, um, and also, he was endlessly interviewed um, about his life. And um, often what he was saying in an interview was the memory of what he'd said in the last interview and on the interview before that. <laughs> and so, you know, yeah, all sorts of distortions crept in and exaggerations and embellishments. I mean, just as a little sidelight on this, I mean, uh, the, um, when the film, uh, the, the BBC television adaptation of his autobiographical novel, A Perfect Spy, um, was broadcast, the scriptwriter noticed that when David was talking about his father, he was actually talking about the fictional Ricky Pym, not about Ronnie Cornwall. He'd come, to, you know, Ricky Pym had come to replace Ronnie Cornwall. And similarly, when he was talking about George Smiley, he realised that, as he put it, um, Alec Guinness stole George Smiley from me. He, he was beginning to think about Alec Guinness playing George Smiley, not about his original conception. George Smiley. So I think, in a way, that's quite an, an understandable and innocent um, uh, element. And I don't think he was deliberately lying all the time, though, of course, he, but I think he was quiet a lot of the time. And he, he, he would, as I said earlier on, he would say, I'm a liar, I'm, 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 I'm born to be a liar, I'm trained to be a liar, and employed to be a liar. Um, and now I write fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask one more question before. You can ask some questions. You describe him right at the end as unhappy. Of what, what do you think that unhappiness consisted? It, was he unsatisfied? Was he? I well, I mean, you know, it's it's just my perception. But I, but when I met him, I think when anyone met him, you, your initial impression. I'd be interested to know what Bruce would say, for example, in this school, but. When you, you met him, he, he seemed so sophisticated, charming, uh, and funny, self-assured. And it was only after a while that I realized that, in a way, that was a mask. And it felt to me as if there was a churning mass of emotion underneath that. 
and a cold heart, um, and that all these, all this unhappiness from his childhood was still there. For example, I think he he went on hating his mother to the, the moment he died. I mean, he you know he never forgave her for this abandonment. It was it was tragic, really. I mean, he, he should have let that go, um, but he couldn't. He just couldn't forgive her. Um, and perhaps you can't really blame her for leaving Rome. You can't blame her for leaving Rome. I mean, I did hear. I never met her, of course, but I did hear a long tape she made, which she sent to Tony, his brother. And I think basically she was a weak and silly woman. Um, you can blame her for not taking her boys with her, right? Um, yeah, good point. Or not trying to keep in touch. Um, um, but um, I think she, you know, she just took the easy way out. Um, I don't think she was a bad woman in the way that that, um, um, that Ronnie was. I think Ronnie was a, a deeply evil person, as David uh, David describes an incident where he met much later one of um, Ronnie's sort of associates, uh, criminal associates, and he's, who said to him, "We was all bent in those days, but your dad, he was very bent." <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, Sarah. I just wondered, um, how did your conversation with Jane about all the infidelities, how did that go? And Nick, that son, writes, doesn't he, under a different name? He writes under the name Nick Harkaway, exactly. yes. yes. Okay. Uh, well, the conversation with Jane was pretty stilted, and yeah. I had the impression that they worked out a script that was mm. already... You know, have been drafted and and and. You mean and he'd helped her? He'd have, well, he'd tell her what to say. Tell her what to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in a way, he was telling me what to say. Um, and and in that passage, you know, the passage that I ended up writing about his infidelities, he. I mean, I'm not proud of this. But there's an illustration in in here of a page that I have written with his corrections on it. Um, uh, and I just had to accept that. Or we did struggle a bit, and uh, I won some of the battles. But um, you know, I, I I think by that stage, as I say in the book, um, uh, I was just so pleased. Oh, I was so at least I was so anxious just to publish the book. I was almost willing to agree to things that at a much earlier stage. I was willing to agree to things that at an earlier stage I wouldn't have agreed to. Um, Again, I'm not particularly proud of that, but I, you know, I, uh, what can you do? <laughs> uh, Anne? Oh, I was going to ask about going back into the room oh. with Jane. Jane. Um, I just wondered why you think as a self-acknowledged liar, he agreed to do a truthful collaboration with you. Well, I think that he thought that uh, as why did he agree to be truthful if he was a liar? Yes, uh, but anyone who didn't hear that, it, why did he agree? If, if he was a liar, why did he agree to a, a truthful biography? I think he thought that he, he, he wanted a prestigious biography um, as part of his legacy plan. Um, I think he was thinking a lot about what would happen after he died. He had um, left his long-term publisher had a headline to, to put it to, for his books to be in Penguin Classics. Um, um, it was all part of the legacy plan. Um, and uh, he wanted to be seen as a major writer. Um, and this was part of his... He, he, he had very... Um, uh, he he, he fantasised that he would uh, win the Nobel Prize, which um, he wasn't ever going to win, was he? Um, and he would, uh, he would say that he wouldn't allow his books to be submitted for the Booker Prize, although, of course, the Booker judges can call books in, so he couldn't have controlled that. But he, he liked to kind of say that he, you know, he was in that... Um, he thought of himself in that, in that... as having that kind of status. Um, this business of lying and why he... Um wanted you to, to not expose some of the truths about his relationship. I'm just wondering, did he um, just formulate this. Did he decide that he didn't want to hurt, I get the impression not, didn't want to hurt his sons and his wife. It was more about protecting his name and, and didn't want uh, in his lifetime for it to be known about all of this. And, I'm unraveling why he didn't want that information to well, come out. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I noticed that he said 
to me on more than one occasion, I don't mind what you write about me when I'm dead. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, what about Jane? Yeah. You know, because I mean, it, it, it seemed to me, and Jane was younger than him, quite possible that Jane would live on quite long. Mm-hmm. He didn't seem to think about the hurt and, and embarrassment and humiliation that he would cause her if I published something that, that, about his affairs. She did, in fact, die only um, a, a, a couple of months after him. Um, but um, uh, no, I mean, I, he, I mean, he, he, he did sort of uh, increasingly live in this world where there were just all these satellites around him. There was Jane as the gatekeeper, and then the kind of courtiers of, of whom I suppose I was one, um, um, who, uh, who would come and go. And, and it was a very sort of egocentric world with David at the centre. And, 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 and very reverential towards his work. I personally think his later work is m- m- not much good, really. I mean, he, uh, you, we could easily lose his last few novels and we wouldn't have lost very much. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, nevertheless, one couldn't say that. I mean, he, he, he was treated with reverence. Um, um, uh, I, one of the problems I think about, in the, particularly in the modern era, is that, that um, writers, successful writers, tend to be above criticism and, and, and increasingly mm. no one and if their editor dares to criticise them they just get a new editor. <laughs> um, I just wondered uh, how you managed to keep your personal feelings um, uh, uh, out of this uh, and, and, and distance because it must have been very difficult as it gradually all unfolded but did you find by the end of it that you really Disliked him because he, he, he doesn't sound very nice person. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 you know, I, I, people often, I, I mean, dare say other people in this room have had this, been asked the same question did you like your subject? After a time, you don't really think of them that way. It's, it's like they're a member of your family, I think. And, and, and it's not really a question of whether you like them or not. You just know them very well. And, 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 and it, it, so it doesn't become so relevant. Um, uh, I, I have to say, watching the Pigeon Tunnel and seeing David laughing and smiling, I felt quite touched. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 you know, I do feel warm towards him. And I think that he did have this ability to make everybody love him. Um, and almost everyone I know who had any kind of dealings with David feels in some way or other bereft. and. That, that some that was stuff left un, incomplete, um, um, uh, and I feel that a little bit. Um, uh, I think that was part of his thing. Interesting to know what Bruce thinks. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I was thinking exactly the same thing. Bruce, you have the floor. Do you want to tell us? I don't think I have anything to add to what you said. It's been fascinating. Uh, I don't feel any sense of something that's missing. You don't? No. But I retain and do retain an affection for him. I mean, I, it's it's interesting you say that because I mean, I Bruce did a fantastic job for for David, um, and I don't think he was treated you very well. Um, um, uh, so you know, I, I don't want if you want to talk about that. <laughs> it seemed to me that David always thought that his life was shaped by his father, mm. and my wife got to know him very well. Um, said that isn't the case. The case is the fact is that it's shaped by his mother abandoning him. And and that's the, the key to his mm. personality. Well, I don't know if she was right or not, but it certainly is partly true, I think. Yeah. And when I announced that I was thinking about retiring, um, a week later, not me but my firm got a letter saying he was changing agents. Mm. <laughs> Um, I was very struck by the fact when you, you spoke about um, what you, you were not writing was his life, but your your um, version of his life, that you used the word version. And it's what struck me also that I was surprised that you were surprised that he thought you should, uh, I was surprised that you were surprised that, he, that you should take down exactly what he said. Um, we've had this incredible example of it, the Lucy and Floyd by Bill Fever, mm-hmm. yes. where Fever, uh, Floyd rang him up every, every day almost in the latter part of the day <coughs> to, to insert a new piece of information that needed to go into the book and share his own, his own story of his life. So this is not uncommon 
everything that people want to tell you about their lives if they think there's something that needs remembering or, or reporting. In your case, obviously, very much so. Well, yes, but I think it depends what you you know what you've said. I mean, what he said he wanted was a a, a warts and all um, a, a arm's length biography, and that was what I wanted. That was what my experience has been and, and, and what I wanted to write. Um, uh, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, as told to, um, or it wasn't a, um, you know, um, uh, as corrected by. Um, 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 uh, but I, 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 I think you, know, you, you and other people would agree that, that any biography is your version of that life, and there will be other versions. I think biography is so polyphonic that it's a lot of people's voices creep into biographies. And you have to listen and catch stuff which you might not have thought or heard or found of your own report through looking through the archives. And that comes in too. So I'd be quite hesitant. I mean, I've of course I talk about my biography. But um, I would be quite hesitant of so firmly saying, I'm going to write my life of you. But you judge what, what voices to include <coughs> and what are, the, what, what are those yeah. voices? But I think I might also have felt that with the awful situation that you were put in with Jane in that room, is that I... I could have, I would have avoided that, or perhaps said, well, if that's how it's to be done, I don't want to do it, because I think it's something that we can leave to the imagination of the reader. You're writing a biography of a husband, not particularly her, and it's, in a way, more, more, could have been more provocative to the reader, to let the reader consider what Jane must have felt in knowing about these affairs. So do you think I shouldn't have agreed to go into the room with him? If he did set it up like that, I would have stepped sideways. Yes. I don't think I fully realised what it was going to be like. I must mm -hmm. admit, perhaps that was naive of me. Um, but also, I think if I had refused to go to attend that meeting, I think that would have been a crisis. But um, no, you, I mean, I hadn't really con considered not going. Perhaps curiosity drove me as much as everything else. <laughs> Although I did find it excruciating. Mm -hmm. Do you incline to a second edition of your first big book, incorporating the first, as well, the second book? Well, I originally thought that that was what I was going to do, yeah. um, but for various reasons I decided to have a... I mean, not, not least that my then editor um, had, was in the process of leaving Bloomsbury and um, as often happens, the, 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 a bit of a, um, uh, with the change of the guard, there was less enthusiasm um, for a new edition, which is what I, so um, I started thinking about a, a different book, and actually I thought that in a way I could say more easily what I wanted to say in a, a new book than a, a freestanding book. But then it begs the question, would I eventually produce a revised edition of would anyone want it? I don't know. I, um, maybe. And, and maybe for a foreign edition, if a, a foreign publisher says, yes, we'll buy both books and we'll... And certainly, um, I mean, this is, all gets so incestuous. I mean, David's sons run a film company called Ink Factory, and they have now optioned both books yeah. to produce a biopic. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I'm kind of... I mean, it's, it's a bit weird in a way, but in another way, it's a solution because if any other film company was trying to option this book, it would be difficult with the family. Whereas they, you know, if they have, have it, then they can call the shots. May I ask the supplementary? Mm. I mean, you, you mentioned that you think the last books are not so good. What What do you think is his best book in your view? Um, I think there are three or four really top books. I mean, it's it's a very you know, the cliché answer, really, it's the Cold War books, and particularly The Spy Who Came From The Cold is a marvellous book. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is also one quite different, much sort of more complicated and richer, not so bleak, but, but fantastic book. And, and I think uh, A Perfect Spy is also a brilliant, or the autobiographical book. There are several other books I like very much. I, I do think that to some extent he lost his subject. I mean when the Cold War ended. And some of his post-Cold War books, I think, are, are, are not at all bad. But I think those are his, his best ones are in that period. And it's also, it's not just to do with the subject, it's also probably to do with him and who he was then. And um, often writers later on are not so good as they were in their first 
flush of creativity. Is there a last question? Oh, yeah. um, given the sort of fixity of his own view of his own life, his own narrative art, do you think, Adam, that you were able to shift that at all, or dent it at all, no. in the course of the whole process? <laughs> well, in, not, in his mind. even one little bit. In his mind, you mean? Yeah, in his mind. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think so, not really. I mean, except, well, I mean... I mean, I do remember an occasion when, um, I, I think I mentioned this um, when Nick and I were talking before, when um, uh, we just uh, we went out to lunch one day and he started to tell me about how he came to teach at Eton and I interrupted him rather brusquely and said, no, David, it wasn't like that at all. <laughs> and, and, and I know because I've just been reading the files. And he looked really taken aback. And I'm quite sure he, that on that occasion anyway, he wasn't deliberately trying to mm -hmm. um, deceive me. I think he believed what he was planning to tell me. And then he was thrown by the fact that I, I showed him that that wasn't true. But in general, I think he, you know, he had his idea of who he was and, and that was it. Um, do, you, do you think he regretted your relationship with him? Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 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 Yes, I do. So, well, I still I don't know really, but I mean, uh, according to Errol Morris, in, uh, uh, interviewed in the Radio Times this week, um, he was furious about my book. Um, so, which, what do you believe? Do you believe Errol Morris or what he told to um, um, that chap on the heath, uh, Derek Johns, when he said, uh, "I glanced at it." Um, um, uh, David was very good at. Um, was it a career error on his part? Do you mean? I mean, it didn't sort of work out because he composed It's not for me to say, really, is it? <laughs> I mean, I think my, my biography of him is pretty good, really. Um, and, uh, I mean, I would say that. No, I mean, just like, having something he couldn't control. And, yes, but I mean, ultimately, I uh, am, a, as I said early on, I'm an admirer of his best work. I think he's a major novelist. Um, and I think the fact that he's a genre novelist conceals his quality. Um, and in the introduction to that book, I compare him to Alfred Hitchcock, um, where I say that the pop his popularity conceals his artistry. Um, and he really completely transcends the spy fiction um, genre. And I think, like, uh, say, you know, we don't think of Jane Austen as a romance novelist. We don't think of Harry Mantel, really, as a historical novelist. We don't, uh, um, um, and we, uh, I don't think we should think of John Le Carre as a spy novelist. I think we should think of him as a novelist. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I hope that comes through. In, so it, uh, it, it's not really a complete answer to your question, but it's a partial answer. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all of us sat through events which, uh, at the end, you ask if there are any questions and no hands go up. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can judge by the number of questions that were asked this evening how. Fascinating your talk was, Adam. So thank you so much for doing it. And congratulations on the book. And may I remind you of two things. One is that the book is available. I'm sure Adam will kindly sign copies at £15. Um, and that the next Biographers Club event is with Anne Rowe, who you may remember is a past winner of our Distinguished Thank Services you to it, Biography Award. Mm. I've come to the end. I'll repeat it for you. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Uh, just let me say, by the way, that we should um, we should get out of here sort of fairly soon after eight o'clock. It's time to wolf down a quick drink. And, <laughs> and right, well, there's only one here. Well, it doesn't matter. Really. <laughs> the wall is sort of taking it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you too to Matt for giving yes, us again yes, a yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you.